The first superintendent of the Naval Observatory was Matthew Fontaine Morey, whose accomplishments during his tenure earned him the nickname Pathfinder of the Seas. But before Morey, a young naval officer, James Gillis, was given the duty of building the observatory and envisioned himself as being named the observatory's first superintendent. Gillis was certainly the logical choice to become the first superintendent of the Naval Observatory. He had secured the appropriation, uh, he had designed the building and secured the instruments, uh, but in the end he was not named uh, the first superintendent because of politics mainly. The Secretary of the Navy at the time was John Y. Mason, who was Virginian and decided to appoint his fellow Virginian, uh, Matthew Fontaine Maury, to be the first superintendent of the observatory. His selection as superintendent of the observatory seemed an odd choice to many. Well, Maury was not formally educated. He didn't go to the higher universities such as Harvard or Yale to, to study science. He was really a self-taught man. He was a man who lived within his time, as he was a very devoted family man and a very religious man, but he was a man who lived ahead of his time. Someone that we would say today is a thinker outside the box. Ironically, Matthew Morey's passion was not astronomy. It was the science of the oceans. And in fact, he's what's called the father of modern oceanography. Maury was interested in all the things we associate with modern oceanography today. Winds and currents, tides, marine meteorology, the depth and composition of the ocean bottom, the salinity of seawater, even the feeding habits of marine mammals. He even took his work home with him in the East Wing where he wrote his magnum opus, The Physical Geography of the Sea, considered to be the first textbook for this new science of oceanography. And this book really won him fame and acclaim, not only here in the United States, but overseas in Europe and around the world. What really made the book unique was in the back section where he had foldouts. He actually had depths of the Atlantic Ocean. You think of that, it's one thing to know the depth along the coast, but to know the depth in the middle of the ocean and along the path of the ocean was, was really quite unique. In addition to his landmark textbook, Maury revolutionized travel on the seas by his introduction of wind and current charts. Prior to Maury's charts, a sea voyage's success was determined by guess and by God. But by 1850, with the California gold rush in full swing, adventurers were looking for the fastest way to get to the gold fields. Clipper ships, sleek greyhounds of the sea, had just been brought to their highest level of speed and efficiency in American yards. Clipper ships were the fastest ships of the time, the fastest ships ever to sail under canvas. In fact, they were so fast, you could have water skied behind them. Using Maury's wind and current charts, a clipper captain sailing from Boston or New York could reach San Francisco, often in fewer than 100 days, a voyage that used to take over 130 days. The Flying Cloud did it in 89 days using Maury's charts. Then, as now, time was money, and Maury's accomplishments were lionized in the seafaring community here and abroad. In the early 1850s, congressmen asked themselves why we recognize Greenwich in Great Britain as having the prime meridian. So they proposed legislation to create the prime meridian of the United States to be in Washington and to be designated to run through the center of the Naval Observatory's dome. When word leaked out about the proposed bill, the seafaring community was not amused. Changing the prime meridian's location would mean that all their navigational charts, which used Greenwich, would become obsolete. Charts at that time were a considerable investment for a ship's owner or the Navy itself. As a result, the legislation died and Greenwich continued its role as the prime meridian for navigation. For the determination of longitude in the United States, however, the center of the observatory's dome would be recognized as zero degrees. Since territories in the West were coming into the Union as states both during and after the Civil War, the boundaries of those states had to be determined. The center of the observatory's dome thus became the reference for laying out the boundaries of those states. For example, the eastern boundary of Colorado 
which is the western boundary of Kansas, is a meridian of longitude measured from the center of the observatory's dome. The science Maury pursued at the observatory had other far-reaching significance. Cyrus Field, also a visionary, had in mind was to connect Europe and the United States. And he wanted to build a transatlantic cable on the bottom of the seafloor. He came to the observatory to confer with Matthew Maury, who agreed, using soundings that the Navy had taken over the years, to lay out an under-ocean profile between Newfoundland and Ireland, a shallow portion of the North Atlantic where it would be feasible to lay a cable. It was connected, and the Queen of England and President Buchanan uh, transmitted uh, messages to each other. Cyrus said, while I supplied the work, and while England supplied the money, it was Maury who supplied the brains. But the Civil War brought an abrupt end to Matthew Maury's career as a world-renowned scientist. For anyone who had to decide whether to remain loyal to the Union or go with the Confederacy, it was a wrenching decision. With Maury, it was, it was a terrible decision. He had the ideal job. He got to do his science. He had no supervision. He did whatever he wanted. He lived on the premises. He was internationally renowned by this time. But he's a Virginian. And uh, in those days, if you were from the South, your state was almost your country. The federal government in Washington was less significant than your state. So he made that fateful choice. And Maury then picked up the pen and he wrote uh, his resignation letter to President Abraham Lincoln. I believe once he jumped ship, so to speak, uh, his mark in, in American history, American science, uh, got pushed to the, pushed to the bottom. Uh, in fact, when he um, left the, the Union, on May 4th, the Boston Herald Traveler, which was the newspaper of the time in Boston, uh, had an uh, ad in there of a $5,000 reward for Jefferson Davis, uh, $3,000 for General Beauregard, and $3,000 for the traitor, Lieutenant Matthew Maury. 